We could do a summer party. <laughs> it's the weather. Can we do this show outside or on the roof? <laughs> Weekdays at 9 on 6ABC. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another week of Women to Watch. I'm Sue Rocco. It's so great to be here with all of you. We have another great show for you this week. Joining me in just a moment will be Renee Heath. And Renee is an inventor. She is an entrepreneur, and she's also a presentation coach with Accenture. Um, one of the most exciting things I would say for Renee's professional journey is landing a deal on Shark Tank with two sharks. So we're going to be talking about that later in the show. Um, also coming up at the end will be Sherry Morrison, our Lifestyle Watch contributor, and she'll be joined by Meredith Klein. Meredith is the founder and director of the Philadelphia Argentine Tango School. So that's going to be a really fun segment. So now I'm very thrilled and honored to welcome to the show Renee Heath. Renee, thanks so much for being here. So it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And congratulations right off the top for being a new mom. Uh, I want our viewers and listeners to know you just had a baby boy a month ago. So we're very impressed that you're here. <laughs> it's It's been an absolute joy, um, you know, sleep deprived, but I'm, I I'm bet. over the moon and in love. Oh, I bet. I bet. Um, listen, I wanted to start off the show um, talking a little bit about your upbringing and your family. And the first question I had for you was, why the move to Mexico? It's one of my favorite stories I tell. My mom and dad um, naturally got pregnant with triplets. And so that meant my family had seven kids at the time. And New Jersey was quite expensive. Um, my dad heard that there was a new and up and coming place called Cancun. And he literally sold everything the family had, bought uh, a pickup truck and a sailboat, packed enough diapers and peanut butter and jelly for a year and drove through the United States, all through Mexico and set up shop in the hope of a better life for their family. Wow, that is a big, bold move from New Jersey to Cancun. My mom is like, if you do anything like that, <laughs> she's like, I kill you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, back in the day, you know, my dad was a risk taker and they tried something different. And how old were you at the time? So I wasn't born yet. And so that's you what actually, born. yeah, that's why I was that's born. Right. You're the well. baby. You're mm -hmm. the baby of eight. So yeah. I, I'm only, my husband's one of seven. So I kind of know what it's like to be from a big family. And sometimes the baby, the last one to come is kind of left to their own devices. W was that the case for you? Not at all. I'll never forget. It was the first day of high school, my freshman year. My dad sat me down and he's like, I know all the tricks. He's like, <laughs> I know everything, you know, having been through it. And he said, you're going to be the perfect one. And he's like, oh. we're going to work on you. So I felt that, um, you know, it was different because actually my oldest sibling is 20 years older. And so they kind of had kids in three phases. So mm -hmm. he had learned a lot more from life in that time. And I was going to be his protege, I guess. Wow. Any pressure? <laughs> Sounds like there was a little pressure to be the perfect kid. Do you know what? I, I knew he meant it in jest. And I just always felt extremely supported and pushed in a good way mm -hmm. um, versus having like a, a helicopter parent, like wanting the perfect kid. So it was all positive. I, I really like the way you share your relationship with your dad um, with me. We had a wonderful conversation. And I think what a wonderful thing he did taking you to work with him and into business meetings to give you a real life experience of that. What do you remember? What was your fondest memory of doing that with him? Yeah, it's funny. My mom still says to this day, she's like, you're your father's daughter. Um, my parents owned a, a small building business in the Poconos. And it wasn't because he couldn't get a babysitter. He wanted to take me along and have me just sit and watch and listen. So we'd go to everything from tax sales to community board meetings. And I would just have to sit there and just observe and listening and taking it all in is probably one of the best qualities that he handed down to me to just listen and um, mm. learn instead of always just jumping in type of thing. Were you a questioner? Was that hard for you to kind of just sit there and be quiet? 
Um, no, my dad was a pretty strong personality. So when my dad said something, you, you kind of oh, did. He, was, he had the military background. He was Army. So there was definitely a, a yes, sir attitude in our house. So, But it came with the trust that my father was asking me to do something for my growth, for my benefit. So there wasn't that much challenging um, because I trusted his authority and his direction. Mm -hmm. So having siblings that were also adults, you know, tell me, what did you learn from some of your older brothers and sisters? Yes, they really paved the way in a lot of ways for me. So um, my oldest siblings make sure they pass down the value of education. Um, many of them went on to master's programs. So I watched them um, you know, using education to better themselves and to further themselves in their career and everything to then like the, the love of travel. Um, I have had multiple siblings that were part of rotary programs and um, they always encouraged me to experience new cultures, different ways of thinking, languages. So there is definitely so much learnings that I have from my older siblings to be able to watch them throughout the years. And can you talk about what your aspirations were when you were young? You know, was there one particular profession you said, I want to be when I grow up? Actually, this just came up in conversation last night. We were talking about a high school yearbooks and our superlatives. And um, in my yearbook, it actually said someday to work for National Geographic. And I oh, think wow. that was because of that, that love of travel and experiencing new cultures and meeting new people. So it hasn't come true yet, but there, <laughs> there's still time. There's still time. Yeah. Well, you've had a very eclectic, I'll say, you know, background and career. Um, I, but I wanted you to talk about Odyssey of the Mind. I've mm -hmm. heard of that program. I think that's very cool. Are you selected to go into that or do you volunteer and, and you know, ask to be a part of it and tell sure, us Odyssey. what it is? Yeah, Odyssey of the Mind, a lot of times you'll hear people refer to it as OM, and it's a program that's in elementary through high schools where essentially you get a, a group of uh, kids together and they solve a challenge. So um, you actually present uh, in front of an audience a play, for example, that you might have written and you'll have designed of all your costumes. Um, and then there's also something called spontaneous where you get to go in a room and the judges might give you uh, a question like name as many kings as possible, where you get like one point for a common answer or three points for creative answers. Or you might go into that room and it might be a hands on problem where they give you like a, a ping pong ball and a tennis ball and a string and you have to get the balls across the room as fast as possible working as a group. So that really just changed my life as a child. You had to try out for it. Um, in order to make that small crew, but it really made my creative juices flow in terms of, you know, concepting what a play could be, uh, you know, getting in front of an audience and performing, you know, the different um, ways and pathways of thinking in order to give those creative answers and those spontaneous programs. So it really laid that creative and performance background for me. Did you find when you were working in groups like that, that you were naturally a leader? Were you someone that, you know, kind of stepped into that role of leading the group? Yes, it's it's in my DNA, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, but it was a, a really good learning experience. I remember one year, because I wasn't chosen to be one of the performers, and that was really one of my passions. And it helped me then let other people lead and see how other people can shine, especially when it comes to like A-B personalities, um, making sure that, you know, you can enjoy people and see the value in people, even though they might not have the same energy or approach as you, they can bring a totally different um, value to the situation. So that was a really great learning for me. And how about something I always like to, you know, ask about something that perhaps was a challenge for you growing up. When you think about those early years that are formative and you're kind of trying to figure out who you are, what is something that you struggled with that, today you continue to, or perhaps you've overcome and, and you feel proud of? Sure. Um, it really, I think, had to do with health in our family. We had 
multiple family members get diagnosed with cancer when I was young. Um, my dad got diagnosed with prostate, my brother with testicular, my sister with breast, and my oh, other wow. sister with thyroid, all within a, a very short time frame. And at first, it kind of made me live life to the fullest, potentially in an extreme way. Like I always had to be doing something. I always had to be completing a project. I always had to be succeeding at something because I felt that, okay, our time can be limited in, in this world. And I mm -hmm. want to get as much, you know, juice out of the orange as possible. Mm -hmm. But as I've grown older, I realize that there's an importance to being idle as well. And it's important to recharge and to take that time to um, be calm and to breathe and using that space to really assess what the priorities are and, and how you want to spend that time accomplishing those things. So I think that was a really big lesson for me is that you always don't have to be on that hamster wheel and that energizer bunny. You're allowed to just take a step back and, and breathe and assess. Well, wow, that, that's interesting to me because I think, you know, first of all, that's unusual to have that many family members um, get that that kind of a diagnosis. That's scary. And you would think that the lesson would be, you know, life is short, go out and do what you can. But there's been this shift in conversation to self-care. And right as a society, I think for a while there, we were getting a little out of control with feeling as though just being still is is not what you're supposed to be doing. Did you recognize that as a young person or later in life did that develop? I think it came via strategic um, people that, that came into my lives um, where I learned that lesson little by little. Um, but I think more recently um, with the introduction actually of, of yoga, where I like learned that practice of really taking that time to be still <laughs> and to breathe, that that's really, changed me as a person in terms of, you know, taking that step back and taking time for myself and that self-care that you spoke of, Sue. Do you, do you find that's when creativity is, is at its peak for you or, or do you get it, you know, sometimes just random during activity? Sure. In yoga, it's kind of hard because you're, you're taught to kind of turn the brain off and to mm -hmm. not think and be creative, which is that hard part of that meditation, right? Is to just being still and present. I actually find my creativity now comes in, in a few different ways. One is just being out in nature and, and I try to walk in the woods a lot. I try to take my dog out as much as possible. And now I try to take Dylan out in the stroller and just kind of accepting the world around you. And I feel like those are those moments where creativity um, creeps in. And then also just meeting new people and, and having really meaningful conversations with friends and with colleagues to open yourself up to just beyond the superficial conversations and to really kind of like throughout COVID where we invited people into our houses and homes like we never did before. I feel like that's happening at work a lot and with people that I meet through my other experiences where people are sharing and opening up more. And I found that's really been inspiring from a creative aspect. Um, something else, I had a note here that, that you were an exchange student. Is that correct? In Costa Rica. So the first time that I was an exchange student, I was actually 11 years old, um, wow. which is crazy because so. I have nieces and nephews who are 11 years old now, and there is no way <laughs> that my <laughs> siblings or them, you know, they would be ready to do that. But my parents knew that it was something that I was mature enough to handle and um, to take in that whole experience. So I was 11. I went down to San Jose, Costa Rica. I lived with the host family. Um, and it was a great immersion program in order to learn Spanish within a school, as well as, to be honest, when you're in the house, like watching the TV and watching movies to kind of take in the culture and to learn the language even further. That's that's very young, 11. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure I would have had the <laughs> that at 11. Um, 
do you keep in touch with that family? Do you still speak? To uh, well, you know, it's been a few years, but there's definitely the holiday cards that still go back and forth. But that kind of set me up for, I studied abroad um, during college as well. I did a semester in Australia and then actually spurred me on to then do my master's program over in England as well. So it really set me up for, for future travel and education. And your family as well brought in exchange students. That was pretty much the the best part of growing up is that we had we had eight children and we need yeah. to bring more kids in. We had a rotating door of different um, exchange students, both with my older siblings um, that ranged someone from Brazil and Germany and Spain to when I was um, in school, we had two girls from Kazakhstan come and also an, another person from Spain. And it was just wonderful um, having those different people in your households in order to, again, learn from them and, and share our lives and get a peek and an insight into theirs as well. The best memory there was the, the gentleman from Brazil. He saw snow for the first time and watching like an almost adult experience something of nature of that magnitude. It was really just uh, amazing to watch him. Wow. Do you, you know, it's mom and dad were purposely trying to um, bring you um, experiences from different cultures and different people, right? I mean, is that something that was um, actionable on their part? Did they talk to you about that? The fact that there's people from all different walks of life and we need to embrace all of them. Yeah, our dinner table was definitely like a no telephone, no TV household um, where we sat around and my dad would go around the table like, what did you learn today and, and what are we doing as a, as a family? So there was definitely a lot of discussion um, about that and exploration to make sure that all the kids in the house were comfortable. Um, but we all welcomed it. We had so much fun and, and so many great memories. Yeah, that's a great, great, great lesson as a parent. And I'm sure you'll do the same with your son um, and any more children that might come. I'm yeah. definitely going to encourage that exchange program for Dylan someday. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, listen, we're going to go into our first break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the idea for your company, Banana Loca. Um, and, and also a little bit about what your future plans are for perhaps new inventions, new products. Stay with us and we'll be back with Renee Heath, entrepreneur and founder of Banana Loca. Action News, celebrating 50 years of AccuWeather. The heat is on. In 2010, Philadelphia had a record of 55 days at or over 90 degrees. And those scorchers, they're on the rise. In fact, 10 of the 15 hottest summers occurred in the last two decades. Thank you for always trusting us to keep you informed. You're streaming and we're streaming. Get the AccuWeather forecast and severe storm alerts 24-7 on our 6ABC streaming app. Whether you're just getting started, already well on your way, planning for your future, drafting your vision, growing toward greatness, or finding that dreams really can come true. Whatever your next steps are, we'll be right here with you, just like we have been for 150 years. Start here, grow here, stay here. Penn Community Bank, here we grow. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the memories. Go for the view that goes on forever. Go for the bubbles in your bathtub and in your drink. Go to bed whenever you want or don't. Go for him. Go for her. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. The following is a real testimonial from the father of a young injured victim. I didn't think she was going to make it. Major Perry's daughter was the victim of a horrific accident caused by someone else's negligence. If you don't find the right counselor, law firm that you're looking for, you will get lost in the wilderness. Badly injured? Call the Fritz and Bianculli Law Firm at 215-458-2222 and find out why they say, we got this. 
Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. The big story on Action News tonight. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hi, and welcome back to the show. You're watching Women to Watch, and my name is Sue Rocco, and I'm joined by Renee Heath. Uh, Renee is an inventor, an entrepreneur. Um, she's also a presentation coach at Accenture. And I thought before we talk about Banana Loca, I wanted to talk about your role at Accenture and how you landed that job. Sure. Um, it's funny because I've had almost a portfolio career within Accenture. I started back in 2015 where I got recruited because of my digital background. I had worked in digital agencies over in the UK, as well as stateside here within um, CPG, within food and beverage. And because of that experience, I, I got tapped on the shoulder and they said, do you want to come over um, to help run what was then a new digital department that they created at Accenture. Did that for a couple of years. And the company is so great from a personal growth perspective, but also just the sheer size of Accenture that you can, mm -hmm. you know, pivot and not have to leave the company. So I took a course in design thinking and I totally drank the Kool-Aid. Design thinking basically is a different way of approaching problems where you co-create with people um, in order to come up with better solutions. So I did that for a few years where I would run workshops um, throughout North America to help solve problems um, for some of the largest companies in the world. And then again, um, our, our company uh, encourages growth and I got tapped on the shoulder to run a presentation uh, program, which is basically helping people feel more confident um, talking in front of clients when they're pitching for work, which is always nerve wracking when I do interviews like this, Sue, or like the one I did on Shark Tank, because it's my job to coach people. So I better be good at talking <laughs> and presenting myself. <laughs> All um, that pressure. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it's interesting to me that you've had an experience of working for a company the size of Accenture and then also starting this small business with this invention of this kitchen tool. So you're really, um, you know, experiencing both sides of what a, a career or a profession can be. And uh, would you say that some people are made to work for companies this, like Accenture? Some are made for entrepreneurship and perhaps we can do both. Yeah, it's funny because growing up watching my parents own their own business, I never thought that I would work in the corporate world. I thought I would run my own business and be my own boss. But the beauty of Accenture really is that you get to meet people from all around the world and work with some of the smartest people on really cutting edge things, especially when it comes to technology and be exposed to different things. So I just love that they trust you're doing your job and let you work autonomously where that feels like, okay, I'm running my own program. So I am my own boss in some respects, even though I work for a large corporation. But there's been totally different learnings on the, the small you know, um, side of things when it comes to running your own little LLC that mm -hmm. has been totally different than what I learned in corporate America. So let's talk about where you were the moment the idea came. And I know there's a co-founder, am I right? It's a gentleman. Mm -hmm. And were you together when the idea came about or was it yours alone? Sure. Um, my business partner's name, Bashara Jade, and uh, for years we had worked together where I hired his agency um, to help me run my digital department. So we had actually known each other for about eight years before we embarked on this adventure. And we had loved um, attending different trade shows and, and sharing what we learned when we travel, when we see different products from around the world. And we said, okay, we know when we know, like, it's kind of like when you put on that wedding dress, it's, it's the one. And Bashar called me one day and said, I, I have our idea. This is it. So he's originally from Lebanon, where growing up, he had uh, his favorite snack, which was peanut butter and Nutella wrapped in a pita bread. 
And he was online one day just searching crazy Nutella things um, because he wanted a way to enjoy it without the carb of the, of the pita. And he came across, you know, a similar type of product that allowed you to put dulce de leche um, inside a banana, but nothing as viscous as Nutella or peanut butter. So he said, why don't we, why don't we try to do this? Why don't we try to invent it? And when he told me, it just was an absolute yes. A, bananas are in the shape of a smile. And B, I had my own problems with my nieces and nephews trying to cut up bananas and then put peanut butter on top. It was just really messy. It's like, it a slip. It does. it's like a slip and slide. <laughs> and then they put it up with their hands and it gets all over. So I was like, okay, it's not the biggest problem in the world to try to solve, but it's a <laughs> time problem for moms. And it would just be something fun. And really what sold Bashar and I was the idea of getting kids involved in the kitchen with cooking, because a lot of times they're told, you know, stay out, it's hot on the stove or the knives are sharp and they're not really included in the kitchen. So we thought this was just a fun invention to get them involved in snack time. So I, I know, I know because I watch Shark Tank religiously um, a lot about all the different steps. Um, I'm, I'm most interested in when you came up with the invention and, and I forget, do you have a patent on it? We do. We have a design yeah. patent. Mm -hmm. Um, and you have to find where, who's going to make it for you and all of that fine and raise the money. That's mm -hmm. hard. Um, when you decided we're ready and, and we can take this to Shark Tank and get a deal. When did that happen? So we actually had a 3D printed prototype that we took to an open casting call at the Javits Center in New York for Shark Tank. And we used that really as our way to see, you know, is there interest in, and are we really onto something here before we embarked on a larger fundraising or proper manufacturing? And when out of all the hundreds, I think there was 500 plus um, inventors there. We had Business Insider come interview us and um, we got the follow up of the thumbs up if they wanted us to come film in the show. We knew we were on to something. So that's when we went ahead and did the Kickstarter in order to raise funds and started um, looking at different production options here onshore, near shore, and then eventually what we did was, which was further offshore in China. Is it, is it, does it, keep you up at night or did it when you're investing that kind of time and creativity for design and and the name and and the money that you could go real far and then it not be revenue generating eventually you know or were you just kind of you know believing in it so i actually believed in it i am the power of positive thought and the law of attraction and all along, Bashar and I just said, if anything, this is an excuse for us to spend more time together as best friends, as well as business partners. So from the get-go, it was almost the thought of doing your MBA, but it just being through a business process versus going to school for it. So for me, the time and the money was an absolute no-brainer. It was a little harder for, say, like my husband um, to try to say, okay, you know, we only have so much extra cash, you know, what do we want to do with it? And is this the wisest investment? So it was bringing him along through the journey and showing how I wanted to personally grow. But it was definitely a validation when we got the thumbs up from Shark Tank. He actually was the banana in the um, our <laughs> local costume in the filming. So he's totally on board now and, and super supportive. So when you get, you know, you got the deal, Mark Cuban and Kevin O'Leary, right? They're on board. What, yeah. what kind of engagement do you have with them now? You know, the follow-up, are you talking to them on a regular basis? Is it their team? How does that work? Sure. We have monthly touch points. Um, it's a lot with their team in terms of back and forth via email and the phone calls. Um, but we do get to connect with them, which is great, both from just advice directly from them, then to connections that they have and different ideas of what we can do. So we have a regular good cadence um, where we check in and, and really partner together, which is great. And, and where do things stand today? So some of the viewers might not have heard of it. You know, where can they buy it? Um, 
is it is it being sold everywhere or just digitally? Is it in retail anywhere? So we've been concentrating on e-commerce mostly. We're on Amazon. That's our big one. Mm -hmm. um, we're also selling direct to consumer on our website at bananaloca.com. And we hope in the future um, to be in a place where we can sell in the bricks and mortar stores, as well as potentially um, shopping at home like a QVC. So there's definitely room for expansion, but we wanted to make sure we hit the e-commerce market hard first and then looked at the ways to different um, avenues for growth. I was actually surprised. I thought for sure when you came in, because I watched the episode that Lori would be all over it. So you never know what's going to happen or where the interest is going to come from. When we did our research on the sharks, um, Lori was actually our number one. Um, I was excited for Barbara too, but she actually wasn't, wasn't there that day. Saying that, Lori did have really great advice to depart on us in terms of, okay, there being different color options or um, different uses for the products, like uh, extending it for use for like cupcakes and cake decoration yeah. and whatnot. So although yeah. we didn't get to partner, um, right. she really gave us some sound advice. So I want to know now, as first of all, you're a new mom and you work for a very large company and you're running this business. That's a lot. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm always proud to say, I never say work-life balance because mm -hmm. I don't believe in that. I think it's just life. And sometimes you're working and sometimes you're playing and sometimes you're creating. What is, can you describe a typical day and how you decide where you're going to put your energy so that mm -hmm. you are, you know, taking care of yourself first? I love the quote, if you want something done, give it to a busy person um, because people really have to prioritize. So pre-Dylan, I am an early bird. I, I wake up quite early. So I was able to just knock out an hour to a day before the typical workday starts. Um, so that's how I previously managed doing Banana Loca as well as my job at Accenture. And luckily, that's the benefit of having a business partner. So during this time, I've had to lean on Bashara for him to take over some more of those marketing and sales communications that I did previously. But that's just like I did for him in the past when he had busy parts of his life, I was able to step in. So that's been the joy of not doing it just by myself is having that mm -hmm. partner there to be able to be your backup um, for when times are a bit crazy, like with a newborn. Right. And how about during, you know, uh, do you have a, a mantra that you live by, something that you look to or remind yourself on the days when nothing is going right? So I actually have uh, the initials of it tattooed on my foot. Um, oh, wow. That's <laughs> so yes, I do. A so have a wow. mantra, yeah. which is actually, I'm going to add on to it. And, and here's why. So it's left foot, right foot, breathe, repeat, because no matter how hard of a day it is, all you need to do in life to keep moving is just simply one foot in front of the other. Saying that, um, with that growth that has come through taking that self-care and that time, I'm actually going to add on to it in a pause or a rest part of it too, yeah. to be like, okay, you always don't have to be moving forward and mm. putting one foot in front of the other. It's okay to then take a pause, but it, historically it's been left foot, right foot, breathe, repeat. Yeah. I love that you could, because there, I, I don't know when it happened in our society that it was all about just doing all the time, doing, doing, doing. And that was kind of respected and, you know, it was impressive. And all of a sudden there's this big and, and, and it came before COVID, I would say, mm -hmm. the awakening to perhaps we need to be doing less, right? Just mm -hmm. taking time to reflect. Yep. And that's actually uh, one of my other ventures is called Made of Lionesses, yes, which is more my, question. Yeah, talk my about creative that. outlet. And it's funny because um, I have people ask me, well, well, how are you monetizing that? Like, how are you making money? And it's like, I I'm not, that's, that's not the reason that I do it. Right. So um, made a lioness is I do different art installations and community events, especially for artists um, in particular, mostly musicians, but also writers 
and creators in general. And a lot of the time, it is me putting in my own money and my own time in order to create those um, new experiences for people and to create those connections and to really build communities. So it's funny because um, you have people just always kind of pushing, like, you have to get, you know, uh, income out of it when really that's not why I do it. No. And, and, you know, if, if I were to, add, you know, a lot of what you have done has been kind of um, focused on business and mm -hmm. then um, charitable, you know, actions and, and making the world a better place. Really. If you could wave the magic wand, is there one thing, what would the one thing be that you would love to be able to make a difference in f first? Oh, I mean, I'm an animal lover. Um, I When people before Dylan asked me if I had children, I would say, yes, I have a fur baby. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, especially dogs are just pure joy and, and love. So if I had to do a magic wand, it would definitely be something to, to work with different shelters and, and work with animals um, in order to make sure that they have healthy and, and fulfilled lives as well. Because um, I love those stickers that you see when it says who rescued whom type of thing. So if I had that magic wand and I could, you know, or won the, the lottery and I can do anything, oh, it would be with puppies all day long. Oh, it would sure. be. So if, if the business takes off, you'll be investing in animals. I, hopefully that would be amazing. Yes. Yeah. Are you working on anything new? I mean, you don't necessarily have to talk about it, but is there, is there a next product? Oh, there's always 10 different ones floating around, <laughs> yes. the brain, right? Um, so we have we have some ideas, but for right now, there's just still so much growth in Banana Loca that we want to keep um, our, our focus in. But we do mm -hmm. have a couple irons in the fire, not going to lie. Yeah. Saying yeah. that, that's from like a, a Bashar and I's business standpoint. Um, but for myself, being a new mom, I'm actually interested in writing a book to help moms through pregnancy and postpartum, because oh, although man. I'm one of the last friends to, to have a baby, you know, I'm 38, I'm a little older, there's still so much I didn't know. And I just didn't have time to read the 20 different books um, that right. people had lovingly given me. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to potentially write like a cheat sheet version of that. That's the, wow. that's the latest idea in the brain. Well, I'm going to have to connect you. One of our sponsors, um, is Shalja, Dr. Shalja Dixit with Curio. And she is focused on helping women through all the different, um, you know, phases of their life, but postpartum is the very first area mm -hmm. that they're working on and it's, it's a digital platform. So I think I have to connect the two of you because I think she'd be very uh, resourceful for your book. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. And my, we just have a, two minutes left. Um, I, I want to know what your thoughts are when you think about your son and the world that we live in today, which I really think no one can argue. It, it's harder for kids today than when we were growing up, right? Mm -hmm. Simply because of the, um, I would say, lack of privacy mm -hmm. and social media and all of that. What do you hope for him um, that by the time he's of age to kind of step out on his own, um, what change would you like to see for him? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree that life was simpler before cell phones in in middle school and high school, especially. Yeah. And um, I, I see the the challenge within my nieces and nephews today. Uh, for Dylan, I'm actually really hoping that he has an alternate education experience where it's kind of a hybrid between what they teach in our school systems to some alternate education where we volunteer a bit more, um, you know, where we go experience nature, where we can travel a little bit in order for him to maybe, you know, think outside the box a little bit. I always said, you know, I don't know if I'm going to start saving in a college fund for him, even though education was pushed on me so much because there are so many different pathways in life that I just want him to be a kind and and open person and not really direct him in any direction that I see versus support him in whatever he wants to do. Yeah, I, I love that kind of philosophy. Let him explore, right? Mm -hmm. And he'll he'll figure it out. 
Um, it was great to have you on the show. I um, will be following you and, and sharing all the information on Banana Loca, and I wish you continued success moving forward. Sue, so, such a pleasure. Thank you. Stay with us. And up next, you'll hear from Sherry Marson, and she'll be with Meredith Klein, the founder and director of the Philadelphia Argentine Tango School. We'll be right back. Action News, celebrating 50 years of AccuWeather. The heat is on. In 2010, Philadelphia had a record of 55 days at or over 90 degrees. And those scorchers, they're on the rise. In fact, 10 of the 15 hottest summers occurred in the last two decades. Thank you for always trusting us to keep you informed. You're streaming and we're streaming. Get the AccuWeather forecast and severe storm alerts 24-7 on our 6ABC streaming app. Whether you're just getting started, already well on your way, planning for your future, drafting your vision, growing toward greatness, or finding that dreams really can come true. Whatever your next steps are, we'll be right here with you, just like we have been for 150 years. Start here, grow here, stay here. Penn Community Bank, here we grow. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the memories. Go for the view that goes on forever. Go for the bubbles in your bathtub and in your drink. Go to bed whenever you want or don't. Go for him. Go for her. Go for the wind. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. The following is a real testimonial from the father of a young injured victim. I didn't think she was going to make it. Major Perry's daughter was the victim of a horrific accident caused by someone else's negligence. If you don't find the right counselor, law firm that you're looking for, you will get lost in the wilderness. Badly injured? Call the Fritz and Bianculli Law Firm at 215-458-2222 and find out why they say, we got this. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. The big story on Action News tonight. The special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Today, we are going to enter the world of dance and with founder and director of Philadelphia Argentine Tango School, Meredith Klein. Welcome to the show, Meredith. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much, Sherry. My pleasure. So uh, Meredith, through her education, which led to tr many travels, um, was interested in dance and music. Um, she became particularly enamored with traditional tango dance and uh, she decided to uh, do some travels. But first, if you could share with us a little bit about your education and where you all started. Sure, I grew up in Narberth, just outside of Philadelphia, and uh, lived there until I went to college in Western Mass at Amherst College. And I had grown up very much involved in music, playing classical piano and singing and such. And so I ended up being a music theory major at Amherst College. And in my last year there, um, a friend in the department started actually composing new tangos. And um, I said, well, that's interesting. And he said, I need someone to go with me to a tango class so I can find out what this is all about because I can't write the music if I don't know more about the culture and uh, the different parts of this art form, including the dance. So we went to a tango class together and it hooked me. It hooked me in a way that, you know, we'll hear about how, how that's played out, but it's, uh, it's ended up kind of, um, taking over my life in the most beautiful way. Well, music is truly in your heart. Uh, we spoke of your travels after college. You did quite a bit with music and dance in mind, and you met some people who had a significant influence on your path of your career. Can you tell us a little bit about your travels and who you met along the way? Yeah, so um, when I started dancing tango, I was a social dancer. And um, at that time, there wasn't that much tango. There, there was tango, but there wasn't very much. 
outside of Buenos Aires. So there weren't that many different tango communities, uh, different dancers. And so for people who danced at that time in the late 90s, early 2000s, we were extremely motivated by travel. We would go find each other. So it was nothing to drive four hours to go to a tango dance, dance for a couple hours, and then drive home for four hours. Like it was very extreme. Um, and so during the six years that I was mainly living in Western Mass and Boston um, and dancing socially, travel was a, a big part of my life just to have these dance experiences. But as time went on, I really wanted a, a, a deeper experience, a, a richer experience, and I started looking for what that would be and ended up moving to Buenos Aires, which is where Argentine tango is from. Um, that was the year 2005. And um, a, whole, a whole new world opened up to me uh, of the, the Buenos Aires tango community, which is unbelievably rich in terms of um, the variety of ways that people are dancing and exploring tango, eventually the variety of ways in which the music of tango is growing, um, the spaces where it's danced, the different cultures within the larger tango culture. Um, and, um, and most of these people also travel around the world. So it's a, it's a global community. Um, and it gives us a chance to feel connected, um, connected to the art form, to the community, and to the sense that this is all going on in ways that we know and in ways that are bigger than we are, um, which is kind of a beautiful feeling. Oh, absolutely. In 2008, you returned to Philadelphia and you founded the Philadelphia Argentine Tango School in South, on South Street. And then in 2009, you moved to a current location on Frankfurt Avenue in Fishtown. So yeah. So, um, so I moved to Buenos Aires in 2005, and from that point until 2008, um, with the dance partner that I met and started working with in 2005, we were traveling around the world giving tango workshops and performances. And so we were fortunate to teach in, I don't know, more than 40 cities in North America and in Europe, Australia, South America. So we just, um, we had this you know, remarkable uh, whirlwind experience. But it all happened really quickly, and I started having the desire to invest in a community, a certain community, um, instead of always being on the road and, and um, you know, meeting and, and teaching such a remarkable number of people. And so in 2008, uh, we moved to Philadelphia, and a friend um, who had a sculpture studio uh, on South Street and had recently become enamored of tango said, hey, why don't you take my sculpture studio and make it into the South Street Tango Studio? Yeah. Um, and so we taught there and ran events. Um, and then he, his uh, rent was going to go way up and we were trying to figure out what was the next step for us in Philadelphia. And we had the chance to buy this building on Frankfurt Ave in Fishtown and did that in 2009, uh, this week, this week in 2009, so 13 years ago. And um, yeah, so for those of you who know what's been going on in Fishtown Kensington, it's just been a, a, a blossoming of... Um, small business and um, and yeah, the, the restaurant scene here is remarkable. It's become we have a wonderful Fishtown Kensington Business Improvement District that's been advocating for this area as a tourist destination. Uh, the NACDC, the, the New Kensington CDC, um, has worked a lot to develop this Frankfurt Ave as an arts corridor. So for many reasons, it really has been the perfect place for us. Yeah, uh, Fishtown is great. Uh, I've had a couple of people on the show that uh, I've interviewed, and they're from that same area. Uh, I mean, the music, the arts, the restaurant scene, everything. It's just, it's it's the place to be in Philadelphia if you want to have fun things to do. Um, I'm learning so much. The extent of my dancing capabilities started with standing on top of my dad's shoes, and he would take me for a spin around the dance floor. And then as I grew up, I started gyrating like Elaine on Seinfeld. So it's, it's not pretty. Um, I'll have to come down for some lessons. Uh, a few of my takes on tango are that tango is sophisticated, but it's not complicated. Um, it brings a sense of romance, maybe more to the observers. And I, I never would have guessed that it's considered a walk or commonly referred to as the caminata. Um, and the partners need to, to be totally focused on each other and their movements. And there's no room for distraction. I mean, when was the last time you were with somebody and had their total, total attention? I, I mean, that just doesn't happen anymore with phones and, and all of the things that are going on around us. It's just so it's we've been taken away from giving people our attention, which is 
if you learn how to do the tango and you learn how to give somebody your attention, it's a great characteristic to have in any setting. So Meredith, you mentioned the origins of tango is a combination of three art forms, music, dance, and poetry. Um, you want people to understand the origins of the dance and its music, and now you are bringing it back to what it was originally and introducing it to new people and to the people of Philadelphia and all cultures. You want to tell us a little bit more about how you're doing that? Well, I just love the, the aspects of tango that you just brought out and highlighted. Um, I'm hoping I can remember them because I'd love to talk about all of them. Um, <laughs> yes, I mean, it's remarkable that um, tango is a dance that's based on walking. It's based on forward side and back steps. And any of you out there watching, um, you know, we could spend 10 minutes together and we could be doing easily the, the basics of what tango is. <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> even on Zoom here, even, we could actually achieve that. Um, and yet, I've been dancing 24 years and I'm still deepening, it's still getting deeper and um, more subtle and more interesting. And that's, it's, I suppose many art forms are like that, but it is quite remarkable, especially because um, the bar to entering many forms of dance, especially as you get older, it feels very high. Or entering many kinds of art forms, it feels like impossible. You're like, oh, if I didn't start when I was five, maybe I can't do it now. Whether or not that's true, I feel like we, we tend to feel that way. Um, but with Tango, we truly have people who come right here to the studio um, every week and, you know, everyone from kids and teenagers to people in their 80s and start and start dancing and start having this experience. And, you know, if they like it, get really involved and become very much a part of a community, a Tango community, uh, and the community in this particular studio also. Um, and it's um, the, the way that it allows people to connect with each other, both in terms of social connection and community, and also in terms of, um, uh, like you said, focusing completely on another person um, is, is greatly, deeply needed um, in, in our world today. Tango is an improvised dance. So even though you may see things that look uh, so complicated that you're like, it must be choreography, most of the time it's not. Most of the time it's 100% led and followed in the moment, meaning that if I'm dancing the follower's role, I truly have no idea what's going to uh, transpire next. Um, and so that's why the focus is so, um, it's so remarkable. That's why it hones our focus and helps us come into the moment. So I love all those things you said. And I know we're gonna run out of time. So in the most brief way, I'll tell you about where Tango comes from and where it is now. Is that Great. Good? Yeah, as you had mentioned, like the, I think the bandiones, the, the, um, the, the, um, the instruments, the bandoneon. That's used in, in most of the pieces um, and how that's changed over the years because of rock and roll and everything. If you can touch a little bit on that and how you're trying to bring those music, musicians and the original music back to our world. Well, it, um, okay, tango is a three-part art form. It's a music, dance, and poetry, and it's from uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and also Montevideo, Uruguay, and it developed around the year 1900. It uh, developed and evolved until a sort of golden age from the 1930s to 40s. And throughout all of that time, the music and the dance were highly intertwined. They were developing and growing together. And then in 1955, rock and roll swept over the world um, and tango dance fell really abruptly out of favor in, uh, and was replaced by dancing jitterbug and, 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 and other, other such social dances. Um, and tango dance started a slow period of decline that continued for decades until by the late 1980s, the mid-1980s, basically there was no tango social dancing on earth. So when I started dancing in 97, um, it, I became part of a, a movement to bring tango back without even knowing it. And so anyone who gets involved with tango pretty much sees themselves as part of this. But the thing is that the music and dance never really came back together. Um, and so, um, uh, we keep dancing to the recordings from 1930, even after all this time. And so what I've been working on here is a growing movement um, to um, convince social dancers to be excited about live music again and convince live music musicians to uh, invest in uh, composing, recording, and performing music that is um, easy to, not easy, that is, that is uh, 
for, for social dancers and um, that helps us move our experience forward instead of always dancing to the same music from the 1930s and 40s. So that's very much what the Philadelphia Argentine Tango School has become about, the Philadelphia Tango Festival that I run and, and all of our events here. Well, it's a beautiful art and it's something people of all ages can do. Um, and I know you have a lot of different programs. I know Wednesday nights are a big night for you to, for people to come down and learn about tango and dancing afterwards. Um, there, there's just so much to do. And the Philadelphia Tango uh, Festival um, a lot, it sounds like a lot of fun and it goes on all weekend. So um, I'm afraid that we're out of time. It's a beautiful art. It, Thank you so much for taking the time to tell us a little bit about it and about the Philadelphia Argentine Tango School. I hope you'll join us again sometime. I would love that. Thank you for having me, Sherry. Sure. Um, for more information about Meredith and the Philadelphia Argentine Tango School, the programs available and the Tango Festival, uh, go to philadelphiatangoschool.com. Uh, Sue will be right back after the break. Keep living your dreams, ladies. Action News, celebrating 50 years of AccuWeather. The heat is on. In 2010, Philadelphia had a record of 55 days at or over 90 degrees. And those scorchers, they're on the rise. In fact, 10 of the 15 hottest summers occurred in the last two decades. Thank you for always trusting us to keep you informed. You're streaming and we're streaming. Get the AccuWeather forecast and severe storm alerts 24-7 on our 6ABC streaming app. Whether you're just getting started, already well on your way, planning for your future, drafting your vision, growing toward greatness, or finding that dreams really can come true, whatever your next steps are, we'll be right here with you, just like we have been for 150 years. Start here, grow here, stay here. Penn Community Bank, here we grow. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the memories. Go for the view that goes on forever. Go for the bubbles in your bathtub and in your drink. Go to bed whenever you want or don't. Go for him. Go for her. Go for the wind. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. The following is a real testimonial from the father of a young injured victim. I didn't think she was going to make it. Major Perry's daughter was the victim of a horrific accident caused by someone else's negligence. If you don't find the right counselor, law firm that you're looking for, you will get lost in the wilderness. Badly injured? Call the Fritz and Bianculli Law Firm at 215-458-2222 and find out why they say, we got this. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. The big story on Action News tonight. The special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Welcome back. That's it, everyone, for another week of Women to Watch. I hope you enjoyed the show. I always want to give a big thank you to our producer, Tone, and also Katiri, who's producer in training. Thank you, as always, to our sponsors and our watch team, and, of course, Sherry Morrison for her Lifestyle Watch segment. Have a great week, everyone. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Android TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. The big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today.